So folks, what we're going to do is while we're in this series on tactics and common behaviors of abusers, we are going to use the same introduction each time because we want to make it very clear what we're, what we're talking about. We want to get some parameters built and some explanation, not necessarily out of the way. That's not the idea. We want to educate you on these these key points. So um, Becky, go ahead and take it away on tactics and common behaviors of abusers. All right. So as we continue to talk about tactics and common behavior behaviors of abusers, there's a few things that I think that we need to keep in mind every single time we talk about this topic. And so first of all, let's define domestic violence. Domestic violence is purposeful behavior. It is behavior that is done for a reason with a specific intent, a specific outcome in mind. And that intent and outcome is to maintain power and control over the victim. So all of these tactics as we talk about them, they're not accidental, they're not a mistake, they were done on purpose. And we need to keep that in mind. The reason it's so important that we keep the on purpose in mind is because sometimes when we talk about these tactics, people will say, I think I'm an abuser or I think I'm being abused. And there's a difference between being abusive and exercising bad behavior. And so we need to keep that in mind. We all make mistakes. We all say things we shouldn't say. Sometimes we're even hurtful to our partner or whoever else. And we need to remember that we exercise bad behavior. The difference is when I exercise bad behavior, I take ownership of it. When an abuser is exercising these tactics of power and control, there is no ownership that is taken. So we need to keep that in mind. And then the last thing that I want to make sure that we always talk about as we introduce this topic, because we're very much talking about abusers, we will use the pronoun he for the abuser and the pronoun she for the victim. In no way do I think that all men are abusive. In fact, I think most men aren't abusive. I think there are a handful of men abusing victim after victim after victim. And so we need to keep that in mind. But 88% of victims of domestic violence are female. Domestic violence very much is a gender-based issue. Again, there's a reason why there's a federal law called the Violence Against Women Act. It is because domestic violence is a gender-based issue. And so we will refer to the abuser as he and the victim as she as we go through this topic. Hello, folks. Rebecca Adams here. I have my co-host with me. This is Becky Vermeer, and she is our expert in the field. <laughs> So, hello. yes, you must give your hello <laughs> greeting. <laughs> How are you? <laughs> Doing great. Good. I'm really looking forward to this. We're going to be talking about the power and control wheel tonight. Becky's going to be walking us through that, and it's fascinating. So I'm going to share the screen when it comes to that point. Uh, is there anything you want to introduce us to before I share it? You let me know when you're ready for me to put it up. You know, I think the main thing that I would say is tonight we're going to require that people use their imagination a little bit. And in so doing, I think we will explain, we've talked in a, the past few episodes a lot about tactics of abusers and how they exercise power and control over the victims. And tonight we're going to try to draw a word picture of sorts. But again, we are going to need people to use their imagination a little bit. So I guess that's the intro is put your imagination hat on because we're going to have to play along a little bit with this one. That works. Okay, folks, you heard the orders. Here we go. <laughs> I am going to share this screen and you are going to see, we actually have two power control wheels that we're going to share tonight. So here's the first one and Becky, you take it away. So anybody who has had any uh, domestic violence education of any kind has probably seen this power and control wheel. It's been around for many, many years. I should have done my homework and told you exactly when this wheel was created, but it's been around many, many years. And it is an excellent physical model of what's taking place in abusive environments. And so people like me who happen to be a visual learner, this is incredibly helpful. And again, when I said we need to put on our participation hats, our imag imagination hats, if you're a visual learner, you'll be able to understand why I say that. So we've talked in the former episodes about tactics of power and control. 
again, when an abuser is abusing, that abuser is motivated to maintain power and control over the victim. So I use this as a teaching tool all the time. If I'm going to classrooms or civic organizations or church groups or wherever, where they're looking for kind of that nutshell version of what is domestic violence and how does it happen, this is it. Like if, if all we ever did was teach people this power and control wheel, they would be completely educated to understand what's taking place in an abusive environment. Now, when I do this in public, when I'm in phys physically in a room with someone, groups of someone, and we're doing this training, we actually ask for participation and we ask for people to come and stand at the front of the room. And so I'm going to kind of draw a word picture for you of how that exercise plays out. So if we were sitting in a room of 50 people, I would say, would someone volunteer to come up front and sit in this chair? And I would ask that person to come and sit in the chair. And then I would say to them, what is your name? And let's say their name is, give me a name. Let's, what's a good name? How about Roger? Let's make it a woman. A woman? Yeah. Uh, Rajette. <laughs> <laughs> I like Rajette. So, you like Rajette? That? Rajette has agreed to sit in this chair. So then what I will say to everybody else in the room, when you look at this power and control wheel, in the center of the wheel where it says power and control, I want you to no longer see the words power and control. I want you to see Rajette. So for the purposes of this exercise, Rajette will be the victim sitting in the middle of the room. Now then the next part will be, I will ask eight people one at a time to come forward and stand around Rajet. So can I have a, a volunteer from the room come forward? Here comes the volunteer, they're standing next to Rajet, and I will say, okay, so you are representing physically for us what emotional abuse is. You are the tactic using emotional abuse. You are putting her down, calling names, you're fat, you're stupid, you're ugly. Um, people will think you're crazy if you tell them I'm abusing you. They're playing the mind games. You are an example for us of emotional abuse. And that person will stand there. And then I'll go all the way around the wheel. Will another person come up? If another person comes up and stands next to the first person. You will be an example for us of using isolation. Now, we've talked about isolation before. Let me step back because normally what I do is I give further examples of what each of these things are. And so I like to tell stories because I feel like in telling stories, people remember what you had to say. So one of the stories I tell when we talk about emotional abuse, I really focus on that making her think she's crazy. And we've talked about it before in a former program, but a story that I tend to share with this is a woman who uh, came and stayed in our shelter, whose abuser was motivated completely to make her think that she was crazy. And so you'll you'll recognize the story when I tell you. So she was the one that when the dinner was done in the evening, she used to like to go sit down in the living room on the couch, turn on the lamp and read a book. Well, her abuser had watched her do this night after night after night, and one day decided for no apparent reason to move the lamp to the other side of the couch so when, and you, if you're like, I'm like her, if I walk into a room and I'm used to doing something, I just follow through with my normal behavior. She sat down and when she went to turn on the light, the light wasn't there. Well, that gave the abuser two things. You're silly, you're stupid, you can't even remember where the light is. And then she all of a sudden started to question herself, why did I do that? Like, wasn't the light always there? Maybe now it's not. He's also the one that would like to take her keys. She'd come in and always put her car keys in a central place and he was notorious for taking the keys and hiding them from her. And so when she finally reached out for services and came, she was coming to support groups, she was convinced she was crazy. She said, I'm pretty sure that I'm losing my mind. I can't keep track of things, et cetera. That's a big example of how emotional abuse can work against someone in order to maintain power and control. So again, I asked the second person to come up and that second person is going to uh, represent for us isolation. So I happen to live and work in Branson, Missouri. Branson, Missouri is kind of the live music capital of the world. There have been over the years lots of people who have uh, kind of bought into that live music capital of the world and they want to come to Branson and they want to make their fame and fortune. So here's an example that I use for isolation. 
let's say that you and your partner live in Kansas City and your whole life is there. You were born there, raised there, your family's there, your church group is there, your work is there, you've worked at the same place. You have a very strong network of support in Kansas City. And let's say your abuser comes to you and decides, hey, we need to drop everything and we need to move to Branson. I'm going to cash in on the fame and fortune of Branson. And then the promises are made. But anytime you want to go home, I'll make sure that you have the opportunity to go home. You can call your mom as much as you want to call your mom and promises and promises. Well, because you want to be in a relationship with this person, you drop everything and you move to Branson. And then that's when the isolation begins, it begins in this particular example. Every time you pick up the phone to call your mom, the abuser wants to have an argument with you. So you get to the place where you'd rather not pick up the phone and call your mom because it's embarrassing that this person who says they love you is now yelling at you in front of your mother. Or it comes time to take the trip. The car doesn't work or I have to have the car. I've even known abusers go so far to remove spark plugs from the car, whatever that is. And so all of a sudden, one day, there's no network of support. There's no family unit that you can fall back on. There's no anything, and a person finds themselves in a complete place of isolation. That's one of the ways that isolation piece can play out. Now, I have to say this, just because you're in a relationship and just because your partner decides, hey, let's move and go do this thing, that does not instantly make them an abuser. You know what I mean? Like sometimes we're, we want to find abuse where abuse doesn't exist. So I'm not saying every single scenario where that happens, that it's isolation waiting to happen. But someone who is motivated to maintain power and control of the victim, that's one of the ways that would play out. Does that make sense? Okay. So then the next thing I'll say, will another person from the room come and stand next to the person who said they were using isolation? And I will say for the purposes of the audience, this person will be a, a representation of minimizing, making light of the abuse, justifying how the why or how the behavior happened, um, saying, well, I bruise easily, again, that justification, saying the abuse didn't really happen. I've shared a story in the past um, of a woman who was in a relationship with her abuser who was sleeping and in the middle of the night, the abuser woke up, she woke up to the abuser hitting her and his excuse was, well, I was in the war and I'm having flashbacks from that and completely justify the behavior. Abusers will do that time and time again. It feeds into that crazy making piece. But the other thing is it takes the light off of them. And one thing that we've talked about in the last several episodes when we're talking about that maintaining of power and control, the abuser does not take ownership of his behavior. So everything happening outside is what causes it, not the actual abuser themselves. And so that minimizing piece is big, that denying piece is big, blaming everything outside of me. And so again, what we're starting to do now is we have, a we have, uh oh, I forgot our a victim's name, Rajetta, was Rajet. that right? Rajet. Rajet. We have Rajet sitting there and we've got now these three people that are standing and they're starting to form a little bit of an arc around Rajet. So you can see her sitting in the chair and these three people behind her. Have another person come up and we'll say, all right, this person is physically the representation of using the children. Using the children is a, a very strong, powerful piece when you're considering escaping from an abusive relationship. I think I've told you before, and I will tell you again because it never ceases to amaze me. When I used to do intakes for people coming into shelter, one of the questions I would always ask them was, why today? Why is today the day? that you made the decision to come into shelter as opposed to last week or last year or wh whatever it is. Nine times out of 10, the statement that I would get back is, he turned on my children. I will tell you that the same victim who stays in the home to protect her children is also the same victim who will leave the home to protect her children. And so we need to keep that in mind. Women in abusive relationships are not abusing their children. They're doing whatever they can to protect their children. The strange dichotomy that takes place in the brain is sometimes protecting your children means staying in the home. And so we do have to understand that. The other thing is, is a lot of times the abuser will say, if you leave me, I'll take the children away from you. You'll never see them again. 
Well, I've seen it happen in the past. Unfortunately, in the early days of being an advocate, I saw it happen a couple of times where in the scenario, he had a job, the car was in his name, the house was in his name. He required that she not work outside the home. And so she was staying home and caring for the children. However, when she decided that she needed to flee from this abuser, he went to court and because he seemed more stable on the outside financially so, he did take the children away from her. And so it's not an empty threat. It's a powerful tactic that abusers use all the time. I feel like um, we've done a really good job over the years of educating our, our court system, our judges about that dynamic, but it still can happen. And so it's an incredibly powerful tactic that abusers use against their victim. <clears throat> Another way that plays out is if you're married, nine times out of 10, that abuser will still have visitation rights with the children. We've seen abusers manipulate that situation and pump the kids for information, tell me what your mom's doing, tell, you, tell me if your mom's seeing anybody, that whole thing. And then they will also um, try to influence the way that the kids interact with the mom as well. So that using the children piece is a powerful piece in helping an abuser empower and control over the victim. So do you have any questions, comments at this point? We're doing good? Doing really well. I okay. know uh, my dad tried to use us against my mom. He didn't do it too awfully much and my mom refused to. She said, I know I could. She said, I refuse to. It is a very powerful piece. And mm -hmm. I knew that my ex would have done the same thing. When our firstborn was about a month old, he turned her over his knee on his lap and he spanked her hard multiple times. A one month old. Next time you see a one month old, just think about that. Yeah, I don't know. I can't even think about that. No. And so I knew even then I should have left right then. And I didn't. Um, that time I didn't leave because it was love. But, but yeah, he would have used the children against me. It's an incredibly powerful piece. And then, you know, unfortunately, and I've said this statement many times over the years, children become the pawn, the pawns in the games that abusers play. And it's even, there's even scenarios where I've seen firsthand of the abuser incorporating the child in the abuse. Tell your mother she's fill in the blank. Tell your mother she's stupid. Tell your mother she can't talk to you like that. Tell your mother that she can't tell you what to do. And as a child, a young impressionable child, who are you going to side with? Like if, if, you're, if you're looking at this and you're seeing this one person has it all and this other person doesn't, you're in this weird position of I love them both, which people don't necessarily understand either. It's a, it's a really tough spot for a kid to be in. The story that I know that happens within the last five years, we'll say, at the crisis center, um, a specific person was in a scenario where they had a child, child in common. They weren't married. The father of the child did have visitation rights. The mother of the child was extremely hesitant to allow that visitation to happen and fought really diligently in court to make that stop. But in the interim was concerned about abuse taking place and other things. When it was all said and done, and I'm, I'm jumping ahead through several years of a back and forth in this scenario where he was completely using the child against her. When it was all said and done, the day that that finally ended was a day standing in a court of law where she said to the father of the child, I will not ask you for one dime of child support if you just leave us alone. And the abuser said, oh, okay, then we're done. Wow. And so he used that child and used that child mm -hmm. to his advantage until it wasn't to his advantage anymore. It was more to his advantage to just be done. And so he just walked away. Perfect Which, example of a child being the pawn. <clears throat> exactly. But if you're the mother of that child, mm -hmm. as a mother myself, I know when my child was a little boy, how painful it was if the rest of the world didn't see how wonderful he was mm -hmm. and see how you should want to spend all of your time with this child or whatever else. And so for her, how painful for her to know that her child is wonderful when it's all said and done, the father of the child was only motivated by money, power and money. And those two things tend to go together. So mm -hmm. that was a really sad example, again, of how that child was used, used as a pawn in that game. Mm -hmm. 
So it is very powerful. Yeah. And so, I mean, I know that it feels like um, we're kind of going through these pieces pretty quickly. I don't want to do that. Um, but I also know that when we've just gotten done talking about a lot of these tactics, we have gone through them in more detail than this. So um, <clears throat> please help me make sure that we're not leaving anything out as we kind of continue to go through it. For right now, I'm just kind of wanting to do the overview because this is a really good kind of summation of how all this process works together. So mm -hmm. what we've kind of drawn, if, if, you're, if people are able to stay with us, is we've got a person sitting in a chair in the middle, and right now we've got four people standing around them. And if you kind of look at the arc in the power and control wheel, each piece of that pie, a person is standing around a person sitting in a chair. So we've got that arc forming around that person. So then we'll have another person come and stand up. So now we've got person number five. And we will say for the purposes of this exercise that this person is a representation of using the male privilege. There is still a lot of that mentality in abusive relationships of I am the king of the castle, the lord of the manor, so to speak. Um, there's a real rigid expectation in this particular scenario of gender roles, what's expected of women, what's expected and even allowed of men that is not allowed of women, um, that treating the person like a servant, you have to do all of the cooking, you have to do all of the cleaning because that's women's work, you have to take care of the kids because that's women's work, I work outside of the home so it's my money. I may give you money if I want to. I may not give you money if I don't want to. Um, we watch what I want to watch on TV. We eat what I want to eat for dinner. We do what I want to do on the time off. That total, I'm in control and I get I call the shots. And I mean, really, that's what an abuser who is using male privilege thinks is I'm 100% in control. It doesn't matter what you want to do. It doesn't matter what you have to say. Whether you agree or disagree, it's all irrelevant. So I see you nodding your head. Life. I was just say, I see you nodding your head and knowing from personal experience, we've talked about some of this. Yeah. You can completely relate to that one, can't you? Absolutely. You know, the, the interesting thing is my dad didn't really use that. He was the oldest and had two sisters. And I think there's, the, it just <clears throat> causes that man to turn out to be a little different. They're a little bit more... I don't know if I want to say sensitive or intuitive, but they're a little more caring. Um, and, and he didn't really, I don't recall that he used that male privilege. Now my ex-husband and my stepdad, oh yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. So did you ever wonder in that scenario with your ex-husband or your stepdad, why do they feel like they had the right to do that? Did, did, have you ever, did you ever find any insight on that, why they felt like they had the right to do that? No, I know for my ex-husband, it was, that was the way their home ran as he was growing up, that mom stayed home with the kids. It was only for a short time that she worked at the schools, um, and the rest of the time she stayed home and took care of the kids in the house and the cooking and the, she, she got a little bored, I do believe, at some point, because she would even iron dad's socks his, wow. under, his underwear his pajamas the pillowcases and I'm thinking to myself you need something to do <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I, I think that's where that came from and for my stepdad I think it was just part of his narcissism honestly and I'm sure it was the way he was raised too but I think for him it was more just a thing of of Look how I've pulled myself up by my bootstraps and look what I've done, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The reason that I wanted to ask that is because that as a standalone piece, you can look at that and not even necessarily recognize that as domestic violence, to be honest with you. You know, and, and you actually just made you, you made the statement yourself. And that's why I was curious if what your what your thoughts were behind that, because well, that's the way he was raised. And so, you know, if it's that hand me down from generation to generation, this is just the role that you fill. As a victim of domestic violence, you may not look at that and think that's an abuse piece. If you came out of a home environment where your dad was kind of the Lord of the castle. And there are a lot of these things that we've already talked about when we're talking about these pieces of the pie, so to speak, that stand alone. When you look at them stand alone, you wouldn't necessarily outwardly just think, well, this is domestic violence. 
No, that's why it's important. I think that they're all put together in this one wheel. And that again, when we get to the end of the exercise and I expound a little bit more on what the purpose of this exercise is, you'll even see how they all play together. But that's why I think we have to be really careful when people make the statement, well, if that happened to me, I would just leave. Mm -hmm. Or um, nobody's ever going to treat me that way. It's, it's subtle. It's subtle and it's calculated behavior. And not everything, even on this wheel, is happening all day, every day. No. The main tactic, I think, and we I don't know that we've said this yet in talking about this power and control scenario and the tactics of abusers, the main tactic that abusers use, why it's so effective is because the rules change every day. The expectations are always different. So just when you're at a place thinking, I've got it, now I understand what that expectation is, it's different tomorrow. You never see it coming. And so it's really easy for someone to sit and look at these scenarios and say, well, that would never happen to me. It could. The other thing is, is we're on piece five of the pie. A lot of people, when they talk about domestic violence, all they think about is broken bones and bruises. I'm kind of stealing my own thunder a little bit by saying this, but so far, there's been nothing physical that's taken place in this pie. And so we need to think about that as well. So then um, the next thing we'd ask another person to come up and stand. Now you're, you're seeing that we're starting to be circular around our person sitting in the middle. So the next one would be using economic abuse. I've heard scenarios of women staying in our shelter where they have not been allowed to have a job outside of the home. They must work in the home. And in so doing, they have to do everything that the, it sounds like male privilege, they have to do everything that the abuser says and they receive absolutely no money whatsoever. They have to ask for money for groceries, they have to ask for money for diapers, they have to ask to use the car. That is an example, a big example of emotional abuse, or I'm sorry, economic abuse. I've also seen scenarios where the abuser says, I'm not gonna go work, you go work, I'm gonna stay home. However, staying home does not indicate I'll take care of the house, I'll do the dishes, I'll take care of the kids. No, I'm gonna stay home and do whatever I want. You're gonna work outside the home. When you come home, you're gonna give me all the money that you've earned, and then you can do the cooking, do the dishes, do the laundry, take care of the kids. And so economic abuse can go in both ways. Another thing that I've seen happen lots of times, and here lately, in the lately I say in the last even 10 years, it's been more and more um, common, I guess would be the right word. If you're trying to apply for housing, one of the very first things a realtor or a landlord would do is they would do a credit check on you. We have seen so many times this, this economic abuse piece play out in destroying a person's credit. So it's a matter of taking out multiple credit cards in the victim's name, running them up, not paying them. There's a, a heap of debt that goes along with that or um, not paying the rent. Oh, but how convenient that the house is in the victim's name. You know, it's a tactic and it's really subtle because I've seen a lot of scenarios where abusers have said, well, let's just put this car in your name. I want this to be your car. Or let's buy this house, but I really want the house just to be in your name. I don't want it to be in my name. Again, I'm not saying that every time that happens, the person is an abuser. However, I have seen it played out in economic abuse where the house is in your name, but I'm not allowing you to work. And so if I choose not to make a payment, guess who's in trouble? It's you because it's your house. In the same scenario, if I choose not to pay a car payment, guess who's in trouble? It's you, it's your car. And so we see that to where from the outside looking in, it could be like, well, how kind of you? to want to do this thing for me. But there is a lot of strings attached to that particular scenario. And I've seen um, so many people who actually have come to our shelter, try to leave and secure housing, did a credit check, had no idea that there was credit cards in their name because they never saw them. But they come to find out they have two or three, you know, exorbitant bills credit card statements in their name and they never even knew they had a credit card. 
So how do you recover from that? Like, how do you convince your future landlord? Well, that's not me. I didn't do that. It's, it's a really powerful tactic. And if you're trying to escape from an abusive situation and you need a safe place to go, how are you going to do that? Because you have no credit. And so we've seen that happen a lot of the time as well. Um, interestingly enough, I will tell you that in the property that we have, we have abusers that show up from time to time. And one of the, the main things that happens when the abuser shows up, they'll say, hey, I'm looking for so-and-so. I would like to know if she's here. You know, our answer is always, I can't confirm or deny. And it's interesting to me that a lot of times the statement is, well, I just want to make sure that she's okay. I want to make sure that she has diapers for the baby or that she has gas for the vehicle or whatever that is. And um, you can tell that that woman when the abuser leaves that that's what the statement was. And they get so angry because they'll say, he never cared when I was living with him if I had diapers for the baby or gas for the vehicle. So that's another example of how that plays out with the Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde mentality even. And I could see my ex doing that because he wanted to save face in the public eye. So this wheel was actually created in 1984. And this time we're going to call the victim in this scenario, Angelina. <laughs> you didn't want my suggestions this time, did you? Yours was really hard to remember. <laughs> now, I doesn't mean I'm gonna remember Angelina, but I'm gonna try really hard to remember that for the purposes of this exercise, that does not say power and control, that says Angelina. So then we'll ask another person to come up from our crowd of people and stand next to the person who's exemplifying using male privilege. And we'll talk about using economic abuse. And we see this go in a lot of different ways. This is a scenario where the abuser says, you're not allowed to work outside the home. I'm going to have the job. So then it's my money. The house is in my name. The car is in my name. I own everything. You're not allowed to have money. I might give you an allowance. Your allowance might be contingent upon your behavior. If I think your behavior is good enough today or warrant it, I might give you an allowance. If I don't think your behavior is good enough, I might take it away. The challenging thing in this type of scenario, and in fact, in all of these references that we've used so far, is that the rules change every day. And so if today the expectation is you do these three things, and if you do those three, th three things well, you get your allowance. Tomorrow, those three things are irrelevant. And it's this these two things that equate you getting your allowance. And so the rules change every day. And so I've said it many times before, when the rules change every day, you're in a position where it's crazy making behavior. You can't win when the rules change every day. When you know the expectations, when you know the parameters, when you know how to live within those expectations and those parameters, you can succeed. But when those things don't exist, you're never going to succeed. And so people find themselves in that perpetual place of this unstable, shaky ground. So let's have another person from the audience come stand up and be, join our circle of using coercion and threats. And so what we'll say about that, I mean, we pretty much know what a threat is. A threat is anything of, if you do that, I'll do this. Or if you don't do that, I will do this. The thing that we have to keep in mind when we're talking about an abuser is even on the small things, if an abuser says, if you don't have dinner on the table by five o'clock tonight, I'm going to throw away the fine china and I'm dating myself by saying fine china. But when five o'clock comes and dinner's on the table, he throws away the fine china. He's teaching you in those little things, if I make a threat, I will follow through on it. And that happens time and time again. What we've talked about in abusive relationships is they increase in frequency and they increase in intensity. And so if the threat today was that, tomorrow it's, if you look at me like that again, I'm going to punch you right in the face. Or you looked at me like that, so I threw something at you. But if you look at me like that again, I'm going to punch you in the face, for example. Whenever there's that threat hanging over the head, what a victim, what Angelina finds to be true is that the abuser carries it out. So there's always that piece hanging over your head. I've seen instances in this when it comes to the coercion piece, that threatening suicide. I don't know what it is in this scenario. I have heard so many stories from victims of domestic violence saying that he threatened to kill himself if I leave, if I left. 
I've even had a scenario where the person went so far to say he walked out of the house with a gun, walked to a tree and sat there with it and told me he was going to kill himself. And I didn't know. I didn't know if he was. I didn't know if he wasn't. As of yet, in 25 years of working at the crisis center, I've never heard that followed through on. I've never actually heard where the abuser truly did commit suicide. I can't, I'm not saying that doesn't happen because I know that it does. I've never had firsthand have that story happen, but I have heard it over and over again by hundreds of different people that tell me that. The level of responsibility that a victim plays in that scenario and why she feels like she can't leave, if he truly does kill himself, who wants to live with that guilt forever? And so we have to spend a lot of time saying you are not responsible for another person's actions. If a person makes a choice, the consequence of that choice is 100% on them, not on you. But you look, take a look at these other pieces of the pie that we've already talked about, the emotional abuse, the blaming, the male privilege, the all of those things tied into with that coercion piece, that threat of suicide is so powerful. There's that other one that um, let's say that she has had the ability to finally file a, a police report and the prosecuting attorney has said, oh yes, we're absolutely going to pick up these charges. So then there's the threat, either you drop the charges or I will fill in the gap, whatever that happens to be. We've seen that happen a lot of times where court cases have gone so far and then all of a sudden we we no longer have a victim in the case. The victim disappears and drops the case. And it's because that coercion piece really plays into it. Um, there's another piece of that coercion and threat that kind of falls back onto the using the children where the abuser may be even physically abusing the children, but the story will be told I'm going to tell everybody that you did that. Now, again, let's go back to the male privilege piece where you're the king of the castle. You have the right to make all of the decisions. You may look incredibly stable in, in public. She may not because she's not allowed to work outside of the home or whatever else. If you come to somebody and say, I'm the great guy in the community, there's no way I could have done that. Then who's responsible for it? There's not very many other options. And so abusers do have the ability, unfortunately, to make a case against the victim in this scenario and have the ability to take the kids away in that scenario even as well, or, or she goes to jail or whatever that happens to be. And so that's a huge, that coercion and threats piece, I would say is infinite. You could probably come up with an infinite number of scenarios where a victim, Angelina specifically, can be co a victim of coercion when it comes to abusive relationships. How does, how does that resonate with you in that particular topic? The first thing that comes to my mind, I drew one line in the sand and I said, you will, I said, I'll leave if you ever, if you ever hit me because it was the same line in the sand my mom had drawn. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's the only boundary she ever drew that I can recall. And so what else did I know? I hadn't had this kind of education, right? Like the audience and I are getting right now from you. And so I drew that line in the sand and <clears throat> there was one particular time and I, I could just hear what you're going to say when I tell <laughs> you this too. <laughs> he had done, he had just been a jerk one more time and I had just had it. And I took and I just smacked him in the face <clears throat> and he took a hold of my hand and got a hold of it, you know, and he just looked at me with the power and control, just like on that power and control wheel. He said, you will never do that again. And it was just, he didn't have to say anything more. I could feel the strength. I already knew how strong he was because we, we, would joke around and we would wrestle and whatever. And so I knew, I knew he was way stronger than I was. He would make fun of me because I couldn't wring out a washcloth or a dishcloth as good as he could. I couldn't get all the water. So he would make fun of that. So I, that was a threat right there. 
see, mm-hmm. look how strong I am. You know, you can never overpower me. Well, I didn't need any other kind of coercion or threat. Mm-hmm. That was enough. Absolutely. So he was, he was not extreme in that because he'd made his point. Mm-hmm. Yep. He didn't have to be extreme. No. No. So then let's call our final person up to represent the final piece in the pie. And this person will be using intimidation. So let's draw a word picture real quick before we talk about using intimidation. We have our victim, Angelina, sitting in a chair. She's sitting in the middle of a circle that has slowly been formed around her by people standing. And so picture with me, if you will, person sitting in a chair with a bunch of people standing around them. Do you have a picture of that in your head? Okay. So using intimidation is an incredibly powerful piece when it comes to power and control. The looks, like you just talked about, all he said, all he had to say, but it was more so the look on his face, I think, that probably solidified that threat in your mind. It's the destroying of property. I talk about this all of the time. People will say, oh, my abuser was just out of control and he just smashed everything in sight. And so then I will say, let's talk about that. Did he smash everything in sight? What do you mean by that? Is the question I get back. Tell me the things that he smashed. He smashed, well, my knickknacks. He smashed my teacup collection. He smashed the pictures of my kids that I had hanging on the wall. He smashed my CDs. Okay, well, what things of his did he smash then in this fit of outrage? Well, now that you think of it, now I think of it, he didn't smash any of my things. That's complete intimidation. What that message is, first of all, I'm in control because I'm not smashing my own stuff. I'm only smashing yours. There's that piece. But second of all, what you what you place value on is no value to me. And I can do with it whatever I will. What an incredibly powerful message that is. How intimidating is that? The things that I hold nearest and dearest to me mean absolutely nothing to you. And that includes if our children are children in common and those are pictures hanging on the wall, you don't care. You will smash those. It's destroying her stuff, breaking her things. Another thing that we see take place when we're talking about using intimidation is abusing pets. We have seen animals injured in scenarios where the abuser is just supposedly out of control, but it's purposeful behavior. You know, and as a, as a pet lover myself, and I know you are as well, I've always said, if you want to hurt me, hurt my dog. And abusers know that, and that is a tactic of abuse that they will use. Then the other thing, there was a story one time that I will never forget for as long as I live. One of the very first women I ever knew working in the shelter came in as a resident. And she said to me, I don't really know if I'm a victim of domestic violence or not. I don't think I've ever been abused. Okay, well, let's talk about that. Tell me, tell me about the scenario. What was the last thing that happened before you called and said you needed somebody to talk to? The last thing that happened, and it was something that had happened multiple times, but it was this particular time that she called. His favorite thing to do when there was a conflict brewing in the household was he would go to the gun cabinet, take out his gun, sit on the couch in the living room, lay all of the pieces on the coffee table, and he would meticulously clean his gun. Every so often in meticulously cleaning his gun, he would pick it up, point it in her direction, seemingly to make sure that the barrel was clean. Never, never made any statements, just pointed it at her and looked through it, and then would go back to cleaning. But she said this particular time, the look on his face, while he was, when he went back to cleaning after pointing the barrel in my direction, the look on his face scared me so bad that I knew that I needed to get away. Her words, he never abused me, is what she said, but that scared me. Well, again, if we go back through some of the things we've talked about in all of our episodes and how all of those pieces play together, she was experiencing domestic violence all day, every day. But because he had never physically laid a hand on her, she thought that she wasn't a victim of abuse. So let's complete our pie. We've got Angelina sitting in the center. We've got all of these pieces of the pie standing around her. Now, here's the thing I want to point out. All eight pieces of pie, 
Not one single one of them have we said anything about physical abuse. Not one single one of those eight pieces of pie involves an instance where physical touch even took place. Not physical touch, not sexual touch. No touch in any way took place. Correct? Yeah. The victim sitting there, the person, people standing around them. Now, if we were all together in a room, I would say, okay, everybody, lock your arms around each other and move in as tight as you possibly can. So Angelina is sitting here in the chair, eight people with their arms around each other, move in as tightly around her as I possibly can. So then I say to the audience, hey, can you see Angelina? Where'd she go? And they say, not really. We, we, we can hardly see her. We can see little pieces of her, but we can't really see her. Then I say to Angelina, hey, Angelina, why don't you get out of that circle? And she, she says, how am I supposed to get out of, how to get out of this circle? I say, without fighting, how you get yourself out of that circle? There's no way I can get out of that circle. So all eight pieces of pie, the threat, only the threat of physical or sexual abuse hanging over her head. She's completely trapped in that relationship and there's no way that she can get out. The only way she could possibly get out would be to fight herself out and either she would get hurt or killed in that process. So that's why I think it's important that we talk about this because people make that statement all of the time. Well, if that happened to me, I would just leave. So I say, hey, Angelina, sitting in that circle, just leave, just leave. Mm -hmm. Her answer back to me 100% of the time, how? How can I get out of this? I'm completely trapped. And that's the answer. And, you know, when you actually see that with a group of people standing in front of you, it's so vivid and so understandable. That's the answer. There's that threat of that physical violence hanging over the head all of the time. Thank you so much, Becky. Appreciate all of this. Absolutely. Great work. Thank well, you. folks, sure. Well, folks, just remember that no matter where you are in the process, you're always free to soar. Mm -hmm.